The executive body of the World Health Organization has passed a resolution on the situation in Gaza. What were the debates around the resolution? A UN peacekeeping force is leaving Mali after 10 years. Why did this force become so unpopular? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. The executive body of the World Health Organization adopted a resolution on the health conditions in the occupied Palestinian territories. This was during a rare special session. Now, the final resolution calls for the immediate, sustained and unimpeded passage of humanitarian relief, including access of medical personnel to Gaza. Now, the debates around this resolution were in many ways a mirror of similar debates in various global fora. Countries of the global north defended Israel, while countries of the global south called for a ceasefire. We go to Anna to understand the debates around the issue. Anna, thank you so much for joining us. Various agencies of the UN have been in the forefront of pointing out the humanitarian disaster, the extent to which uh, this Israeli genocidal attack is damaging, is destroying every aspect of life in Gaza and for that matter even in the West Bank. So could you maybe take us through what the discussions at the Executive Board of the World Health Organization were like? Well, uh, it was a rare occasion, if uh, we can say that. So the executive board is not so keen on meeting uh, on at special sessions. And now what happened here was that a number of member states, as well as the de director general of the WHO, were quite vocal in the past weeks about the necessity of a ceasefire in order to get enough medical supplies in order to restore some, some sort of health system uh, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and essentially what they managed to do is to push for this special session to discuss on the humanitarian situation in Gaza and then there to propose a resolution that would address some of the aspects that they knew were most problematic from uh, from the point of view of health. Uh, so, you know, on the one hand, you had the technical discussions. Of course, there, there is a technical introduction given by the appropriate WHO program. Uh, which is based on what they're observing on the ground, because we know that the WHO teams are there with the other UN agencies. Uh, they are working together with other Palestinian organizations uh, in order to uh, ensure that some kind of healthcare can be provided in the hospitals and in the primary health centers that remain in Gaza. Now, of course, uh, we also know that the number of those hospitals, the number of uh, those health centers is declining by the day. Uh, as uh, as the team of health emergencies reported there, uh, there were uh, only three hospitals in the south of Gaza uh, on Sunday, which were able to deliver surgical care, uh, which of course, you know, we don't have to point it out here is that uh, it, it's essential, it's crucial at, uh, at moments like these. Uh, so uh, again, uh, the, the WHO teams, uh, the WHO secretariat makes a point of uh, raising what the occupation of Palestine, what the war on health in Palestine means for the health workers, what it means for the health infrastructure uh, in, uh, in Palestine, in all the occupied Palestinian territories, as well as for the people who are now uh, dislocated, they are living in overcrowded shelters. They're more and more exposed to uh, to epidemics, to outbreaks of infectious disease. So again, uh, it, this kind of the technical part of the meeting, uh, it reassess what what WHO has been saying all along that if it continues like this, uh, we can hope only for a worse situation to uh, to appear when it comes to public health. Now, on the political side, uh, what's interesting uh, is that. Uh, Many of the members inside WHO have been calling for a ceasefire, especially those in the region. Um, on the other hand, we have the we have the member states like the US, we have member states like the European Union, uh, who have been calling for something very different. Uh, so, uh, it, what was the biggest uh, the biggest success of this meeting essentially was uh, that the executive board meeting was concluded by consensus. So there was no voting on the resolution, which uh, which was put in place afterwards. All the AB members agreed that it was uh, it was necessary to call for uh, unimpeded flow of humanitarian aid into Gaza. Although uh, many of them, of course, made a point that they did not agree with the final language and were uh, were agreeing to this only in the interest of uh, of, uh, of of yeah of supporting something that all member states could uh, could stand behind. And an interesting point you mentioned at the end, uh, the in the name of of course compromise, 
there are both sides uh, in various ways unhappy but let's look at the side you talked about which is the us and its allies and we know what you know they have sort of across the world in various fora been uh, the narrative they have been pushing the excuses they have been giving in the context of the world health organization eb what was the argument that the representatives of countries supporting israel were giving well uh, again it was not not much news there so it's uh, always the same same argument that uh, the countries uh, from the global north repeat when this is concerned uh, so of course you know uh, there were representatives from palestine and from israel in the room speaking uh, and uh, what was interesting to hear uh, although not surprising again is that the us and the uh, israel representatives uh, put forward very similar arguments you know there was a lot of talk about uh, human rights there was a lot of talk about 75 years of the un charter on human rights um there was also a lot of calling out people in the room for not respecting the um, the current human rights framework because they were speaking against israel uh but then on the other hand you know uh there were um there were quite a wow moments at that uh, at, <laughs> at the meeting because if we look if we look at the un meetings the language is very boring it's uh, it it kind of drains all uh, all content out and all interest out uh, but then there are those moments where uh, representatives say things that uh, from where we as people who who, who are devoted to human rights stand uh, should never be said and so one of those moments uh, i think was when the un uh, when the us representative sorry uh, said repeating what the israeli delegation uh, was arguing before is that a ceasefire would not only be unrealistic at this point it would also be harmful uh, it would also be uh, counterproductive essentially after after he hearing all the reports coming from from the representatives of uh, the members of the who uh, who were exposed directly to us led wars hearing something like that coming from 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 a number of delegations uh was uh, you know it, it made quite an impact because it essentially shows how much uh, the perception of the us in the international spaces like the who is disconnected from what we are observing on the ground right anna finally you could also maybe take us a bit through what the latest reports are saying regarding the health conditions in gaza you of course mentioned uh, the lack of hospitals but what is the other information that we have uh well just yesterday there was a there was a new statement released by the palestinian medical relief society which again uh you know um it, all the reports including this one they tend to repeat what has been reported on health for the past weeks uh with the very important difference that things tend to get worse and worse so now um uh, what the pa palestinian medical relief society is saying is that of course bed occupancy rates at hospitals including in intensive care units are way off of charts so they're uh, close to 300% in all hospitals that are operating right now the health workers they have not had a break since uh, uh, since the attacks began at the beginning of october they are tired they are working without uh, without supplies they are working with uh, with patients who require quite specific care without being able to provide them with anything um so uh, essentially now one of the most pressing concerns of course is also addressing the living conditions of people who have been displaced uh, who are now living uh, in un schools who have taken shelter in hospitals because we do know that uh, the incidence the, so uh, so the number of cases uh, of people uh, with infectious diseases is rising that's also something that the who has been warning about is that in addition to people having uh, increased uh, cases of diarrhea of uh, respiratory uh, infections now we're also talking for all of this time we have also been talking about populations like pregnant women like children uh, who essentially have no no way to access the care that they need right and thank you so much for that update we'll come back to you in the coming days as well The UN multidimensional integrated stabilization mission in Mali or MINUSMA is leaving the country after 10 years. This comes after Mali's government demanded that the forces leave in June. The mission which numbers around 14,000 was initially welcomed as people believed they could fight rebels who were wreaking havoc in the country. However, 10 years later their stock is pretty low and there was widespread support for the government's decision to ask them to leave. We go to Abdul for the details. Abdul thank you so much for joining us Mali has been at the center of many geopolitical developments uh, over the past few years and has played an important role even after the Niger coup 
which took place in recent times. So the role of the UN forces was something that was very closely watched across the world. So now the UN forces are officially leaving. So could you maybe give us some context as to why these forces were there and what led to their leaving? Ever since the war broke out in Libya, uh, uh, following the NATO intervention uh, in 2011, uh, there had been a different, uh, 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 there had been a repercussion, regional repercussion for that war. A large number of militias emerged, which basically spread all across the region. And Mali was one of, since it shares a border, it, it was one of the uh, victims of, you can say, the war of the war in Libya. So ever since that war, uh, a, a kind of separatist movement uh, basically emerged within Mali, of course, backed by the weapons and the fighters coming from uh, through Libya. Uh, and basically, after that, the then government in Mali bas asked, uh, the, basically appealed the United Nations uh, for interventions in the way that a peacekeeping force was required. And then a uh, peacekeeping force was uh, deployed at that time. Ever since then, though, uh, despite the fact that there were thousands of uh, uh, peacekeeping forces uh, called MINUSMA uh, 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 were there in the Mali, uh, but uh, the the peace, uh, the objective of peace, of course, did not materialize. Uh, uh, the violence continued. Finally, in 2015, uh, the government had to sign an agreement with the forces, uh, what in generally called the separatist forces in Algerians. And since then, there was an increasing demand that these international forces, all the international forces, uh, including the French troops, which were also there uh, for uh, from the same time onwards, uh, which should withdraw because uh, their presence leads to different kinds of problem, particularly the killing of innocents become an issue. And, and, and therefore, uh, they should leave. So in June, after uh, a military coup, uh, when the new government came to power uh, in, May, uh, in, sorry, in 2021, uh, and in June this, uh, this year, uh, basically they demanded that the UN forces should withdraw uh, after, of course, asking the French to withdraw from the country. So French troops have already left the country, and now the UN troops are uh, leaving. Uh, Though officially it ended, the mission ended on Monday, uh, of course, there are few more troops and few more stations left, which, of course, are not official anymore, and they, they will be dismantled in coming uh, days. Uh, so this is the context in which uh, the UN forces were deployed, and uh, uh, the reason behind their leaving is the, the, the current government in Mali does not think their presence uh, any beneficial uh, for the people in uh, of Mali, and there is a growing a strong sentiment against the presence of any foreign troops in the country. Right, Abdul, we're in fact seeing a similar situation taking place in the Congo, which is not very far away. Uh, and in fact, very far away in Haiti, there's a lot of opposition to the possibility of a UN force. So UN forces, I think, in many parts of the world are seen with a considerable amount of skepticism, especially considering that their goal is supposed to somehow be peacekeeping and stuff like that. And it does not seem to have worked out. But how do you see this also in the context of the geopolitical developments that are taking place in the region? We know there is a closer integration of countries in that part. Well, uh, ever since the uh, the incident or the, what we generally call the coups uh, in uh, Niger earlier this year, uh, which led to a kind of emergence of a coalition uh, between uh, Mali, uh, Burkina Faso, Niger, and some, of course, some other countries backed it. Uh, basically, this should be seen in the context of their historical experiences with the uh, uh, first the colonial powers uh, intervening in their internal matters. Um, and, and not letting uh, the, exploiting their resources and 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 of course of course deploying forces to basically uh, claim uh, uh, legitimacy uh, in the name of fighting terrorism or fighting uh, uh, quote unquote separatist uh, uh, militias. Some uh, sometimes they also claim that this reason the presence of foreign troops are required primarily to kind of protect. The people in these in these reason from the extremist global terrorist organizations like Al Qaeda and so and so forth. Of course, these arguments have been uh, uh, the people in these reason have seen the uh, the bogus uh, uh, the uh, the you can say emptiness of these arguments because these troops have done nothing more than kind of sustaining the colonial occupation in the region. And that realization has led to emergence of a strong popular sentiment in the region against 
all kinds of uh, foreign external presence, primarily the presence of ex-colonial uh, powers. Though the uh, Minusma forces uh, are were not made of the French troops, of course, but uh, because of the French troops, presence of the French troops, and because of the uh, the their historical uh, the the legacy with which they had been there in the region uh, has basically uh, led to a kind of some kind of uh, you can say skepticism about the even forces as well and that basically should be seen in the larger context of their colonial experiences so yeah the emergence of uh, 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 the uh, the new set of uh, rulers come emergence of the new set of rulers in these region their understanding of the, the colonial past and and basically has has led to a much more closer cooperation among them. And uh, that cooperation is primarily anti-colonial, one should remember. Uh, uh, and when we say anti-colonial, of course, uh, bo both political as well as economic aspects of it should be uh, uh, should be remembered. And, and therefore, one should not be looking at what is happening to the UN forces uh, as a something, as a, uh, as a, you can say, the, the sh uh, short-sightedness of these uh, uh, of the, these ruling establishment, because there is an argument that the withdrawal of the troops may lead to further violence in the region, but they are ready to deal with that violence domestically. They are ready to ba basically start negotiations with the what uh, asked uh, hitherto separatist uh, groups, uh, but they are not ready to compromise with the presence of the colonial uh, powers in the region. And that is the clear politics uh, which has emerged in last few years particularly since the uh, uh, the coming of power of the uh, new set of rulers in uh, in the region. President Abdullah, also I think important to note that these uh, ruling establishments, especially the military governments, are very strongly backed, it would seem, by a mass public support as well. Exactly, exactly. A very strong public support. In fact, uh, the... Uh, in Mali, just to say, uh, just to give an example, there was a referendum in June, which basically more than 70%, uh, 80% uh, people voted in favor of the current establishment and their plans to kind of transit, transit from the military rule to the popular, uh, 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 popular rule uh, with their anti-colonial uh, policies, complete adherence to their anti-colonial policies. So one should not see it as something uh, the rulers are only uh, military uh, uh, pe people from the military establishment. They have a strong uh, uh, popular backing, uh, which has been reflected in the large scale of mobilization in support of them, uh, as well as the institutional measures they have taken, for example, the elections and referendums, whenever they have initiated. A, a, a huge enthusiasm has been shown by the people uh, in those uh, measures. Right, Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. That's all we have in this episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back for another episode tomorrow. In the meantime, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org and follow us on all the social media platforms.